Getting Married, A New Life. The decade of the 1970s, with all of its political challenges, ended in the most eventful turn in my life. I got married in 1981. On my 40th wedding anniversary, my eldest daughter, Lindewe, was interested in knowing how her mom and dad got together. I gave them a short three-minute response, but she was keen enough to realize that there must be more than that to the story. Well, in a sense, there is and there isn't. After all, it is all about love. In 1972, when I visited my friend Atherton Martin and was robbed of the opportunity of enjoying the estate manager's house, we had to retreat to the comfort of his mother-in-law's home in Rose Street in Roseau. The parliamentary representative for the Castle Blues constituency at that time was Mr. H.L. Christian, who also lived on the same Rose Street, about five houses up the road. I started to return to Dominic in 1974 and having been asked to leave the island three times, Afi used to jokingly say to me that if I really wanted to explain my activities, all I had to do was to walk up the road to the Deputy Prime Minister's home and tell him my story. My rebuttal to this job was that the only thing I wanted to tell Mr. Christian was that I would come back and marry one of his daughters. Well, at that time, it was a good laugh. The fact is, when I met Mavis, my wife, in 1978, I hadn't even made the connection that she was indeed one of Mr. Christian's daughters. It all worked out well. He didn't even have any recollection of my activities in Castle Bruce during those early years, which goes to confirm my belief. We should not get too excited about what we are accomplishing today because most of the world is simply going about their lives in ordinary time. Our friends have congratulated us on the longevity of our nuptial connections and asked how can we manage to stay together for so long. My standard response is that I had fallen in love with a caring, understanding, and very accommodating woman, and nothing was going to spoil that. However, there may have been another cause. You have to remember that before I got married, I had spent about 10 years traveling through the Caribbean, organizing the group activities of ACT. During these times, I stayed with my friends, and they were all married. In a sense, you may say, I have had a ringside seat being an apprentice in training for good husband making. Let us just say I learned well what not to do when I got married. The other thing was that Mavis was from Dominica and I was from Guyana, but we both decided to settle in Trinidad and Tobago. Why Trinidad? More by default, I suspect. I was not going to live in Dominica after my experiences of having to retreat when the immature politicos rounded up their usual suspects for deportation. Guyana was not an appealing country to me as I had left there in a time of total racial chaos. In addition, Trinidad was an easier place from which to organize the programs of ACT. The thing I learned from my pre-marriage training was that the husband is the more likely partner to forget the date of his wedding anniversary. That was not going to happen on my watch. I got married on August the 1st, 1981. Now, August the 1st is a public holiday in most Caribbean territories celebrating Emancipation Day. But it is not a feeling of emancipation that I was after. I wanted to ensure that every year, when my wedding anniversary came around, the state will remind me by giving everyone a public holiday. It worked. I never forgot it. 
a World Bank Fellowship Grant. Fortunately for me, I was able to settle down and reduce my traveling very early in my married life. This significant phase of my life was rewarded by a World Bank Fellowship in 1982 to explore my work on reconstructing data gaps in analytical data. The Robert S. McNamara Fellowship Program was established in 1981 with $2.8 million in funding from the World Bank and other governments. The fellowship was available to candidates with PhD degrees only. The objective of the fellowship was to match aspiring economic researchers from developing countries with World Bank research economists, creating unique opportunities for the fellows to participate in rigorous policy-relevant research. I happened to notice this announcement in a professional magazine of the World Bank in November the 30th, 1981. Actually, it stated a deadline for the application as December the 15th, 1981. I sent a cable to the office administering the grant saying that I was interested in applying, but I could not guarantee that my application would arrive before the closing date. They encouraged me to apply because they had extended the deadline to December the 30th, 1981. We, Bertrand and myself had literally five days to come up with a research proposal. The plan was to give the proposal to Louis' brother, Ian Bertrand, who at that time was in charge of the National Airlines BWIA. Ian had the ability to fly it up to the USA and have someone mail it in that country. That still left us with the challenge of defining a meaningful purpose for the research proposal. The biggest obstacle that ACT was facing in its support of small farmers was in the poor quality of data. Data on small farmers' crops was scanty. The Central Marketing Corporation would collect wholesale prices some months and then forget about it for another couple months until someone checked up on the data collector. It was obvious that they were not using the data they collected. If they were doing so, a more reliable regime of data collection would have been implemented by then. We came up with the idea of a research project that would explore methodologies to fill in data gaps in agricultural price data. I composed the project and with all of my credentials, sent it off to the World Bank. The bank had promised to announce the winners of this award by January 31st of the following year. So you could imagine the sense of hopelessness when February arrived and my new wife asked if we were still expecting to hear from the World Bank. In late February, my wife announced that the World Bank had called to speak with me. They wanted to know if I would be willing to conduct my research within a reduced budget. Winning the McNamara World Bank Fellowship was just short of a miracle. The response to the program had been overwhelming. With some 5,681 applications from around the world, the selectors had to choose the best 10 applicants. Actually, it would become the best 11 applications if I would accept the reduced offer. Both my wife and I were overjoyed at this prospect. Louis' response was just fix these data series so we could use them with some level of reliability. One of my friends from the University of Wisconsin-Madison called me to confirm that I was the person being mentioned in the announcement. He was now working at the World Bank and said the circular had made its rounds about the first awardees of the McNamara Fellowships and he wanted to confirm it was me before bragging that he knew one of them personally. I believed that the reason why I could have put together such a strong proposal was that I was living the experience of data gaps. I spent the better half of two years visiting with economists and statisticians in the World Bank and the mathematicians at Cornell University learning how to reconstruct old data series. It was a combination of projecting trend lines between gaps 
conditioned by some independent value anchor in the rest of the economy, such as the retail price index or wage indices, etc. It gave us a workable solution to price data for locally produced food items. The Mystery of the Wisconsin Forecaster Sometimes it takes others to see the true qualities inside of you which are driving your passion. It was not until I had completed my fellowship work in 1983 that I first encountered David Stanfield, professor of land economics at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and leader of the Terra Institute, Inc. David and another professor had come to Trinidad to undertake a consultancy on assessing land tenure and land ownership in Trinidad and Tobago. After scouting around for a local counterpart company, they ended up in Act's office, which at that time was manned by myself and Louis Bertrand. Louis was busy establishing a strong ground force of poll takers in all the electoral districts in the country. He had done so well with conducting polls for political parties that by now the large manufacturing companies were hiring him to do market research in the field on the performance of their products. There was an obvious symmetry between what Louis was building in experience and what David needed, that is, someone with a proven record to gather his baseline data on land ownership across the country. Having been satisfied himself that Louis was the person he was looking for, he turned towards me with an introductory remark. So what is it you do? Trying to stay relevant within the field of data collection, I gave him my McNamara Fellowship story about my quest to figure out how to use data series that had major gaps so as to make meaningful forecasts for farmers. David then turned aside and said to me, Yeah, I know your type. I was a little put off by what sounded like an accusatory remark. I politely asked him what he meant. He told me this story. There was a radio station announcer in rural Wisconsin who, among his announcements each week in the winter, would give a report on the depth of the permafrost in the cornfields in Wisconsin. The permafrost depth measured the level at which the soil was thawing out as we moved from winter to spring. Farmers monitored this because they wanted as early a start as possible in sowing their grain, barley, oats, millet, etc. Farmers would take great risk if he started to use his plow on the land before it had thawed to an adequate depth for mechanical plowing. This was important information to the larger farmers. The farming community, however, was fascinated by the accuracy of this guy's data. Here he was, reporting that the permafrost was 6 inches in this county, but up to 10 inches in that county. Everyone wondered, how did he get so precise an information forecast? Well, the folks at the university decided to investigate him to find out how he built his model for predictions. It turned out that, at the beginning of each week, he had a list of undertakers he would call to find out what they had found last week in the graves they had dug for burials. David captured exactly how I felt about data. The data was continuously being generated by human activity. You simply had to figure out a way of collecting it, interpreting it, and applying it as useful information. So here was this broadcaster bringing the casual information of a group of grave diggers to a group of large farmers who saw it as strategic information.